good, uh, good evening, everyone. Delighted to see folks, uh, both here and online. Uh, I'm David Madigan. I'm the Provost here at Northeastern. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jeff Mulligan, Sir Jeff Mulligan, Professor of Collective Intelligence, Public Policy and Social Innovation. That's what I'd like to be when I grow up. Um, at University College London. Uh, Jeff was the chief executive of Nesta, the UK's innovation foundation between 2011 and the end of 2019. Earlier, he held multiple roles in the UK government, including director of the government's strategy unit and the performance and innovation unit and head of policy in the prime minister's office. Uh, prior to that, he was chief executive of the Young Foundation uh, and he was the first director of the think tank Demos. He's also been a reporter on BBC TV and radio. Uh, he is the author of the upcoming book, When Science Meets Power, about to appear in January, which calls attention to the growing frictions caused by the expanding authority of science, uh, which sometimes helps politics but often challenges it. Today, uh, he will discuss whether democracy can amplify the intelligence of a society rather than dumbing it down, and whether it can be loved and trusted and seen as essential to people's well-being. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jeff Morgan. <clears throat> thank you very much, David. Yeah, I've got a mic here. Um, and thank you for a, a fantastic hospitality I've had the last two days in Northeast and some great conversations. And I was told the price of having great conversations, I had to say something uh, and give a talk. But I hope this can be a bit, uh, a, a bit conversational. Um, and I will probably go quite fast through a lot of stuff, but so I hope there is then some time for violent disagreement, challenge, uh, creativity, which uh, for me is what a university should be about. So, well, you've already said some of my background, a bit of working sort of top down in city, national governments, the European Commission, the Parliament, creating uh, various organizations. I chair a com private company as well now. Uh, and working in between in foundations and now at uh, a UCL. And I kind of write books mainly as therapy for myself, to be honest, to try and work out what I think. Uh, and I edit this journal on the left, co-edit it, uh, which will be having a big event hosted by Northeastern next summer, we hope, uh, it turns out. And last year, a book on, on imagination, which I won't be talking about today, but is... Uh, uh, the basic essence of that argument is we have a deficit of social and political imagination, which is causing all sorts of problems. And the new one, uh, which David mentioned out in a few months' time, about this very strange era we're in when so many of the issues governments are dealing with, uh, like pandemics, climate change, AI, are dependent on science. Yet the gulf between the capabilities of politics and the tasks they need to do seems to be growing bigger and bigger with all sorts of frictions. And so in the book, I both look at the history, the present, but also make some suggestions about how we might do a little bit better in the future. But again, I won't really talk about that. I was given my title uh, on democracy, uh, which uh, I'm, I'm glad, because I will share some questions. And I know people in this room probably have better answers than me. I'm going to use various analogies about cars and driving cars, uh, and you will understand slowly, <laughs> I hope as I speak, why. Um, and in a way, the essence of democracy uh, is how to steer a whole society. The very word government comes from the Greek for steering. Uh, this is what we want our institutions to do, to steer us through often uh, stormy uh, environments. And the question is, do they do that well or, or badly? And about a year ago, I finished a study on how countries around the world had handled the pandemic in terms of their use of intelligence. And we use the car as the analogy that when you're driving a car, you need all these things, your data, your models, your evidence, your tacit knowledge, creativity, and foresight. And this was a frame for looking at how well Taiwan, Estonia, uh, Canada, other countries handled the complex dilemmas not just of infections, but also of schools and mental health and communities through the very strange uh, 2020 to 22 period, which now feels like uh, another era. So I thought I would use this a little bit for thinking about uh, democracy as well, how we steer. Um, and this is where 
yeah, all sorts of different faculties of a university come in as well. This was the framework we came up with for thinking about the sort of the cognition of a state, which on anything from a pandemic to climate change to unemployment has to be all the time combining its data, its evidence, its models, et cetera, into, uh, into decisions. And some do it well, and some do it badly. So as David said, my kind of exam question is what in the next 10 or 20 years will allow democracy to help us steer, to amplify the best of a society, not the worst, its intelligence, wisdom, and virtues, not its folly and meanness. And across the world, I think we see some countries which do that, where, as it were, their democracy expresses the best of their character and others where perhaps it uh, expresses the worst. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot more of the worst than the best. This is data some of you will be very familiar with, which shows that by each generation seems to have lost confidence in democracy as a system of government. You see the steady decline to the uh, millennials at the, the bottom. We're in this extraordinary secular decline in confidence uh, in democracy. Uh, and this is a survey of, I think, about 30 countries, trustworthiness in different groups. Um, scientists and teachers at the top, which is probably most of you, and then you know, civil servants, government ministers, politicians generally at the bottom. So at a time when we often need governments to do lots of stuff, elected politicians, we have a, a dramatic deficit of confidence in their ability to do these tasks well. Um, and I'd be intrigued to how any of you would answer these polls. So um, democracy also has a lot of challenges. Um, we were talking earlier today about Xi Jinping thought, which is more and more dominant in Chinese educational institutions, uh, which in a way asserts that uh, an authoritarian um, version of capitalist communism is more effective, gets things done better than uh, slow, uh, chaotic democracy. We still have uh, versions of Daesh or Hamas who have their own picture of what governance should be. Uh, Modi and many other authoritarian leaders still within democracies, but offering uh, a very different visions of the future. And my favorite is um, Peter Thiel's ideal, seasteading. Have any of you seen this? This is the kind of libertarian utopia where we all live on these little sort of pods and don't actually have to interact with other people or a government uh, at all. Um, that's not quite my vision of utopia. But there are these challenges. The strange thing is that even though certainly the authoritarians claim to be more competent, if you look at the rankings of government effectiveness around the world, the democracies are still far ahead of the non-democracies in terms of any objective measures of just capacity to get things done, though usually quite small countries, and mainly countries with high levels of snowfall, um, except for Singapore, <laughs> which is the outlier. Otherwise, you know, having a lot of snow and being small is a great thing in this world. So we can exaggerate you know, these, these, this sense that democracy is losing out to authoritarianism. But there's no doubt it is in a deep, deep secular crisis. So uh, why is this and what is to be done? Well, for me, it's long been clear, and perhaps not just because I come from the UK, part of the reason is the essential forms of democracy are 19th century or even 18th century ones. The idea that you have you know, parliaments in a capital, that you have parties, elections, all these reforms which essentially took shape many, many generations ago. We still have a House of Lords. You have an 18th century electoral college. Uh, and in terms of daily life, ever more distant from a world of, um, yeah, of platforms and data and so on. And so that's one side which I think has slowly corroded the credibility of democratic institutions as a whole. And they've also, I think, failed in terms of delivery and results for many people, not everywhere. Um, they say you can't eat democracy. Africa's seen yeah, seven coups in three years. We all know this global data of the democratic uh, recession. And the key argument I want to make before getting on to democratic innovation is that we need to think of democracy not just as one person, one vote, or kicking out bad governments or all these things, which are important, but as an assembly. 
And nearly all the technologies we use every day are assemblies of multiple elements, like the laptop on the table there. You break it apart. This is what it includes. A car is an assembly of all sorts of different things alongside its engines, you know, wheels, steering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And simplistic solutions to democracy, I think, ignore the fact that it's much more like these things than like, a, I don't know, a Coke bottle or something. Uh, and it's the multiple elements of elections, supreme courts, party structures, da, 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 which make the whole add up. And every part of that assembly actually needs innovation and rethinking and reimagination in the near future. And that's what I'm going to talk about, how we innovate each of these parts and then pull them back together into forms of democracy which both deliver results, the outcomes people want, and the feelings of agency which are just as important, the feeling you are recognized, listened to, part of decisions. And in a way, it's that double failure of democracy, both either to deliver the outcomes people want or the feeling of empowerment is its, is its, is its current uh, problem. Rather, the countries where trust has declined most are usually the ones where the results haven't been great and there isn't that feeling of, uh, of engagement. Now, across the world, Enormous sums are now spent on R&D, mainly in this country. So this is the, the top uh, spending last year, 680 billion in this country. Uh, South Korea, Finland spending about 4% of GDP, Israel about 5% of GDP, but almost nothing on R&D for democracy, as far as I'm aware. You can't even count it. It would be invisible on a chart like this. So this thing, which is our most important possession in a way, a democratic system, we don't care to innovate in it. We will spend enormous amounts on nanotech or aerospace or, or AI, uh, but not on, sorry. But we've co-opted social media technologies to support democratic efforts. So uh, have we? Well, no, well, yeah, you go back to this. this <laughs> Ten years ago, we had, we had a much more positive view on the use of that tech. So yeah, yeah. I don't know that you necessarily need to only look at investment in democracy tools for democracy or the adoption of technology. Yeah, but people... may have been developed for other reasons. Fair enough, but me and people like me and Beth 20 years ago were talking to the Googles and others saying, why don't you also do some R&D, tech development for democracy or against misinformation? And there was a choice not to do so. It was, not, you know, these were discussed quite a lot. There were choices about where to direct these vast sums of money and brain power. Anyway, we'll come, I'm going to come back to social media in a little bit. So going back to the car analogy, we're sort of driving through these storms like pandemics, uh, long economic crises, distrust. Uh, how do we help our democracy adapt? So this very ugly picture is my attempt at breaking down the assembly of democracy. To think of it as a kind of car with wheels, there's one wheel which is about how we decide who makes the decisions, who gets elected, candidate selection, party structures, and so on, which I won't talk about, but they're very important. And there's a whole debate to be had about voting systems, et cetera, et cetera. I'm mainly going to talk about the, the right-hand side, which is how, how we make decisions. And the reason for doing this is that I think the role, and I'll come on to the role of AI, I think it has different roles for each of these different sort of stages of democracy, from how issues are framed, options are generated, scrutinized, how decisions are made, implemented, and so on. And we need to break it down. We need to disassemble the democratic innovation question in order to know where technology can have most uh, impact. And we've got something to build on, and some people in this room are part of the, in some ways, extraordinary spread of innovations in the last 10 years, but usually quite small-scale ones. So we have you know, lots of participatory budgeting, and you've been doing them in, you know, uh, in, in Iceland. The mayor of Paris had a big budget, uh, and Kashkaish in, near Lisbon is a, you know, a really interesting current one, quite a big share of the budget for citizens to decide on its purposes, and I think really importantly, a chunk for each school, which Paris also did, so children learn agency, they learn to be Democrats allocating money rather than just passive observers. So lots going on there. We have uh, any number of citizens' assemblies. Uh, Macron had a big one, which was, I think, an interesting failure, because it wasn't 
integrated into government in the right way, and he rejected all of its recommendations. And lots of more local ones, like Brussels now has a permanent citizens' assembly on, uh, uh, on climate, and there are literally, I think, hundreds of them uh, now. Governments beginning to do crowdsourcing. Even the German government in the pandemic did Wir versus Virus. I don't know if you know this one, where they, you know, they open up a crowdsourcing uh, program for the German citizens to come up with ideas about um, uh, combating COVID. I think this was the first national hackathon Germany had ever, had ever, uh, uh, ever done. And in the UK, we've experimented quite a few different things. This is just one small example of a parliament mobilizing networks of experts, thousands of them, to advise on different topics, to orchestrate the expertise, the scientific knowledge you need for making decisions, as IPCC does for climate. This is our Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology beginning to do it around everyday issues in parliaments. And Congress, I know, has, has something similar. And our Cabinet Office has a collective intelligence um, a lab using collective intelligence methods for, for prediction and forecasting and policy design. So these are becoming kind of mainstream, not quite mainstream, but there was very little there at all uh, 10 years ago. And I think what's interesting about the innovations, and again, in terms of our mindset, is to think not just about what happens within the system, and this gets to your point, the surrounding system. Democracy depends on what's informal as well as formal. So all historians will say that what happens on the street, as it were, matters as much as what happens uh, within a parliament. This is South Korea, where the people got rid of a president and got their president into prison, uh, which is not necessarily precedent. a precedent every country wants to do. Then maybe you want to imprison some president, presidents here. Uh, <laughs> uh, and. Uh, um, I think I've got the picture. That's Argentina, an extraordinary story of their, their uh, abortion rights campaign, which eventually did get uh, Parliament to pass a new law. I think it was last, last year. And a healthy democracy is one where actually the street, the external extra parliamentary forces can have a healthy interaction with the ones inside the system. The same is true of the media. You know, a healthy democracy is one where you have an information ecosystem where there is some place for truth and argument and so on. Uh, and, uh, and again, that interacts with the formal system. And the lesson of the last 20 or 30 years of democracy around the world is you can't think of it just in terms of elections and votes and parliaments. It depends on all these other elements just as much. And if they're not healthy, your core democracy isn't healthy either. And this is a battleground. So Finland, I think, was the first country seriously teaching um, school kids about misinformation and fake news, so it's part of the curriculum. We don't do that at all in the UK. Uh, it seems to me insane that any country shouldn't be teaching children this uh, now. And a really interesting argument last month in Europe, where for the first time the European Commission threatened big fines for X for spreading uh, false news about the uh, conflict in, uh, in Gaza. Uh, and this is the, they didn't in the end do anything, but this is the state actually taking some responsibility for the state of truth, the, in a sense, the truth ecosystem uh, which democracy actually depends on. So if those are some of the sort of broader innovations around democracy, what, what about AI? Where does AI, AI help us? Um, AI it's probably obvious to this group, but I mean, sometimes people don't realize it means quite a lot of different things, from robotics to large language models to machine learning and so on, with somewhat different uh, implications for democracy. And still, I think, an underdeveloped really debate about which of those can help us uh, solve different species of problem. So going back to this framework, uh, I had a slide where I listed lots of different things AI could do for each of these stages, which I, I won't bore you with. But they range from um, you know, the analysis of, for example, of social media discourse to see emergent issues, emergent hopes and fears, emergent anxieties, which I think should be part of a, a healthy democracy. There's lots and lots of tools to help you. Sorry, it's gone a bit awry. You know, for, for options generation. Um, to actually get the germs of a, of a bit of a policy idea 
and add on to it. And uh, you were showing earlier today at the Burn Center some of these emergent tools using variants of, of chat GPT. There's, I'll, I'll show a bit later some of the tools for evidence synthesis and analysis um, and for meeting design and decision and for implementation and scrutiny. For each of these, there's actually at least five to 10 potential AI applications which can enhance the quality of the process. Uh, and quite a few of them also, like the Finnish example, reinforce the underlying social capability you need for your democracy to thrive. Uh, the, the, the quality of engagement media, et cetera. So some of these, um, the organization I set up a long time ago, Demos, did quite a good survey not long ago on the use of Polis, which is an AI tool for, um, for meeting design and democracy, and quite a lot of uses of it now across the world as a tool for helping guide groups towards better answers and towards consensus. Um, v Taiwan's probably the most famous, uh, a little bit fragile given the state of its of Taiwan, but um, a still I think extraordinary attempt to reinvent democracy for the 21st century using digital tools and enabling large-scale citizen input into the shaping of options, the liberation on options, and their implementation. There are lots of smaller uses of policy, a uh, polis. Uh, around the world. This is one from Austria, the Klimarat, which I think is about, a, they had about nearly a thousand people using polis to come up with um, uh, climate related uh, policies. And there's another sort of strand of, of AI use around helping citizens have a real time engagement with decisions. Helsinki has been one of the, the pioneers here where you can say what things you're interested in, and then you will be kept informed about decisions. You'll know when you might be able to input. Uh, and they've also experimented with all sorts of uh, games, and again, participatory budgeting. And where this goes next is the much more sophisticated algorithmic tools to shape the modes of engagement to your cognitive style, your preferences, your interests, so that your city feels like your city. <laughs> So it's constantly talking to you, it's using what is mainstream for many of the social media platforms, but to give that feeling of agency, which so many people miss, which so many people feel they've lost in democracy. So that's some of the sort of stuff uh, I think we should be doing much more of uh, and experimenting with. Um, there's an enormous amount of money now going in this year to uh, personal assistance, AI-driven assistance, Microsoft Copilot. Uh, Mustafa Suleiman, who was one of the founders of um, DeepMind, launched Inflection AI back in June or so. I think he's got a couple of billion raised. And these are, these are personal, you know, this is the idea that the next stage of AI and software is something which really understands you, your choices, your behaviors, your needs, and helps to guide you through those choices. Now, in my view, this has enormous potential for care for education, for all sorts of fields. But it also has pretty big implications for politics. If you had one of these, which really does scan all the candidates' uh, you know, proposals, their track record, whether they tell the truth or lie, no, this would be an enhancement, I think, for democracy, to have a sort of avatar friend supporter. But as far as I'm aware, no money is being spent on R&D to adapt these sort of PIs, PAs to help democracy. I might be wrong. Tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, I say a wall of cash going into these, but almost none of it to help, um, help democracy, help save democracy. There's also a great deal of potential with large language models around evidence. Uh, I published a thing about a month ago based on an event we did on trying to look at all the different tools and how well they did in providing synthesized evidence on different questions. ChatGPT isn't very good at that. <laughs> it hallucinates, it you know, can't tell the difference between, uh, even with good prompts, um, what's true and false. But we found a half a dozen really good uh, tools, the most widely used, quite uh, familiar ones like illicit.com. And I'm working with a team on what we're calling Epi Reviewer, which we think is better than illicit. But means if you are, let's say, a congressman or woman, 
you need to quickly know what is the evidence on X, it will give you a reliable synthesis trained on reliable research, validated peer-reviewed research, not just everything on the internet. And again, these are potentially game changers for the everyday life of democratic institutions and for citizens who need to know what, what the world knows about something. Uh, India is experimenting in all sorts of interesting things uh, on uh, applications of technology. This is the most, I think, the interesting one from the last year because it opens up a quite different route for public policy. Are you familiar with ONDC? Is anyone in this room? OK. So these are um, open networks for digital commerce where essentially the government creates a meta platform. So the platforms aren't owned by meta or Google or whatever. So it's a meta in another sense. Uh, and they've shown they can dramatically cut costs for consumers for various services. And of course, once they do that, they can start gathering data and can target proposals and offers and so on to citizens. Now, this might be ideologically unacceptable in the US, but it's a really interesting potential evolution of algorithmically guided platform technology to deliver something really useful to the public, cheaper food, cheaper uh, transport, and so on. And uh, I've been long interested in these sort of um, these new hybrids of citizen science, collective intelligence, and AI, where probably air quality is the most interesting field. This is just a couple of um, uh, pictures from one study last year on this, where citizens are generating some of their own data on air quality, combining it with government data, sometimes business data, and using this to guide the shaping of, of options and alternatives to uh, change the quality of air in a city. And so this, this new sort of hybrid of citizen science, collective intelligence, public policy, and the environment, I think, is a very, very fruitful one. And again, it gives people both results. Their air is cleaner. Their kids don't have the harm from horrible toxins, but also feelings of agency, feelings you can change stuff. So yeah, innovations for intelligent decisions and feelings of agency. So the key, maybe it's a really obvious point out of all of this, is I think what democracies need is not sort of a singular solution. It's not as if quadratic voting or something like that will solve all the problems. It's a repertoire. The most successful democracies have actually a wide repertoire of tools to use for different kinds of tasks um, and are willing to experiment. And this is where the R&D thing comes in. Uh, the book I mentioned on imagination looks a lot at the lessons from art and design, which reinforce this very famous comment from Linus Pauling half a century ago. He said, the best way to get good ideas is to have lots of ideas and throw the bad ones away. Uh, the film The Mystery of Picasso is my favorite film, which shows this as Picasso paints on a glass pane. Has anyone seen this film here? Yeah, you have, yeah. And you see an incredible fertility. He tries things out, he gets bored, he changes it, he paints over. And you realize the creative process is about trying lots and lots of things out, just as Edison tried 10,000 materials for his, his light. And one of the weird things I've observed, in governments, they never do this. They try and have three options and then analyze the pros and cons of all three. And in universities, and this one may be an exception, it's almost never done either. <laughs> Again, uh, the idea in a university you come up with 300 options for a problem and then get rid of 297 is quite alien, quite unknown. And yet this is the way you get to good ideas. And uh, one of the things I, I've been working on are sort of creativity tools which help accelerate this process of generation. And this is, again, what I think we need in democracy, is multiplication at this stage of options, testing them, and then getting rid of the bad ones. And this then relates to the repertoire point. There are lots of ways of mapping the kind of innovation space for democracy. This is just one, but I think it's quite a, a useful one for things like citizens' assemblies. You just think, for any topic, how much specialist expertise do you actually need to say something sensible about this topic? That's this axis. And the other axis is about the strength of moral belief. And it gives you a kind of landscape of issues. So 
your sort of uh, Reykjavik stuff, you know, and a lot of the participatory budgeting is about what to do about the physical fabric of a neighborhood. You don't need that much specialist expertise. It's not deeply morally contested. And actually, these are very amenable to very radical innovation. You've then got other topics which are very moral, but not very specialist, like um, gay marriage or what have you. Again, they can work, but it's a different kind of democratic innovation needed. And then others which are very specialist. So, I mean, no country, I think, has yet done a citizens' assembly on quantum. But it would be kind of crazy to do it. No one knows yet, will quantum destroy all privacy, all cybersecurity? But at some point, we will need new ways of debating the politics of quantum, but it won't fit into anything like the same mechanisms as these. And the same is true of things like cloning, which are, again, deeply moral and specialist, but they, again, need a different species of, of institution and method to be legitimate. So this is about repertoire, having a variety of tools rather than thinking in democracy one size uh, fits all. And the same applies to meetings. I've been boring several of you about my side obsession with meeting science and the need for much more sophistication, what kind of meeting works for what kind of task, whether it is a cabinet, a Supreme Court, a Congress, or a conference. And this is maybe where Northeastern could do the world you know, a lot of good by bringing some of that science to bear on how we design democracy, because democracy is a lot about meetings, and many meetings in democracy don't work well. The loudest dominate them. They don't lead to happy, happy outcomes. Maybe we'll come back to that. So um, I'm going to throw a series of quite quick, oh, I better go quick, um, sort of issues where I think more research and, and experiment is needed. And I'll go very fast. One is a crucial issue for democracy at the moment is the long term. How do we actually attend to the interests of future generations? Um, in Wales, we have a commissioner now for future generations who's meant to do that as part of government. Lots of bits, governments have bits of um, institutions doing this. Here in the US, you've had all sorts of forecasting competitions using AI and CI to forecast. And we're beginning to get, in some parts of the world, parts of nature with legal personhood. New Zealand gave a, a river and a national park a legal status. And the discussion then comes to giving them an AI avatar to represent them uh, in constitutionally. So it's a very interesting, quite novel field of taking the long-term future seriously. But what does it mean? How do you actually do this? This seems to me a great topic of both uh, research and experiment. I'm very interested in a completely different one as well, which is can AI help mutual trust? We have a lot of data showing that mutual interpersonal trust correlates with trust in institutions and with democracy. And the World Happiness Surveys, which always put Finland and Denmark and so on at the top, also show that it's things like answers to this question. Are there people you can turn to in a crisis are the best predictors of happiness? And yet again, there is no R&D program for this anywhere on the planet. <laughs> uh, we know that the people who are loneliest, lonely, loneliest yeah, are often the ones most likely to vote for authoritarian politics. There is a correlation between this and, uh, and political populism. And yet, as far as I know, very little work is being done on how AI can help attend to this. Uh, doing social recommendations, for example, spotting the people who may be suffering uh, uh, pressures of loneliness. So again, a space of both uh, research and experiment. I'll jump over these two, actually, though. Infrastructure, yeah, I've got the time, and this. Um, and maybe just finish with, with just say one, one sentence on a, a thing I put out last week with a colleague where we've been trying to experiment with how you create rooms which allow teams to think in a holistic way about difficult choices, literally putting one wall with the facts, one with the evidence, one with the innovations, one with the systems change. If you're interested, have a look at that. I want to just end with briefly two, two comments, um, which are kind of live versions of this, which I don't quite know where we go. So the first is the question of the governance of AI itself, which is probably is one of the central issues for, for politics this year and next. 
uh, what, do we, what do we need? Uh, and we have some people saying, like this guy in London a couple of weeks ago, it's an existential risk, we're all doomed. Uh, you know? um, and we had the really embarrassing thing, I think it was two weeks ago, where our prime minister interviewed, Rishi, uh, interviewed Elon Musk, um, deferential to him, but it was almost a symbol of how politics is so scared, so doesn't understand AI, it doesn't know what to do, how to govern it, how to regulate it, etc. We've had these slightly unperfect attempts, like the EU has attempted to create its risk-based framework. I was a bit involved in this, uh, in its AI Act, which comes into force in 2025, but was rendered almost redundant as soon as ChatGPT came out. So a real challenge for governments, how you deal with the pace of change. China has its um, cyberspace administration, which in a different way is struggling with the same, uh, same, same issue. And I've argued that just as I think of a democracy as an assembly, actually how we deal with AI is much more like how we've dealt with the car in the last 100 years. So if you think about the car, which dates back 140 years or so, we've learned to surround it with a huge array of different rules. Um, road markings, speed limits, drink driving rules, emission zones, you know, safety, seat belts, etc. It's become a complex sort of system of governance to get the best, not the worst, out of the car. And I think the same will happen to AI. I think of this as the thousand cell matrix where we have all these different possible risks, all these different domains, all these different responses. And each one, if you think of it as a, as a three-dimensional matrix, is a different cell, which will probably have different answers in each cell. And yet most of the debate is still as if something generic about AI safety or foundational models will be the answer, which I think is a, is a, is a complete category error. But filling out this matrix is one of the great tasks we need to do quite urgently. And, you, and the, the, the Biden executive order so last week, two weeks ago, I thought was in some ways going in the right direction by disaggregating the, uh, the issues and the problem. Uh, and I've also, with others, um, advocated creating a, a global, an IPCC for AI, which I think may just possibly emerge out of all of this. And again, I won't go through some of the, the things. And very finally, um, one of my interests, and this could be something uh, for Northeastern, is the question of how to create new public institutions. Because real living democracy is not just about elections and Congress men and women and presidents. It's also about the array of institutions you have to, to regulate or govern, et cetera, et cetera. And you recognize this picture, this is from Reykjavik. This is the uh, unknown bureaucrat, uh, <laughs> which is a, a lovely picture, I think. Uh, I think in Iceland, they think it's, quite a, it's meant to be a nice image, not a, not, not a bad thing. Um, but yeah. Um, and so we're about to launch the thing called the Institutional Architecture Lab, TEAL, to work on the design of the next generation of public institutions we need for things like AI or mental health, or decarbonization, helping to, in a sense, widen our, our menu of ways of thinking. Are they pyramids? Are they more like myceliums or, or rhizomes or whatever, uh, or, or networks? And to bring together evidence uh, and, uh, and design, working with governments at city, national, and uh, at a global level. And these are just some of the ones, again, I won't go through this, which are our sort of prompts, interesting ones from the last uh, 10 years or so across the world. Uh, and these are some of the spaces we're looking at, uh, we're working on now, including perhaps crucially the second last one, election protection agencies. This vital task we have of stronger institutions which can protect us against attack uh, and subversion by um, Russia or China or whoever else. Very, very finally, um, in all of this, uh, and this is something I do argue about in this new book on science. I think we're in an interesting moment when our very thinking about sovereignty needs to change. So the heart of the US Constitution, as in all the democracies, is a kind of idea that sovereignty 
resides only in the people, we the people. And I think we're beginning to move away from that to an idea that sovereignty actually is shared. It's shared partly with nature, with the nature we depend on, but it's also shared with the collective knowledge of science. In a sense, it's the claim of our collective intelligence on us will sometimes clash with what the people want. And I think this collective knowledge actually makes a claim for sovereignty as well. So if you're interested, there's a whole lot of political theory in my, my, my book about, about this. But it has big implications for the organization of democracy to almost ensure that every time a decision is being made, it is consciously using the best available knowledge from the world, from the past, from the present, and not just whatever we happen to want at a certain moment in time. So that's a few points, I hope, you know, about why I think democracy is a threat, why we need to redesign it, innovate furiously, take an R&D approach to it, why AI as a general purpose technology has to be part of this, but in many, many, many different ways, not single solutions, but a repertoire, and looking at the environment, the weather for democracy, as well as its particular forms. And 200 years ago, your, um, one of your founders, John Adams, said there never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. He turned out to be wrong <laughs> then, but maybe he could be right now unless we do our best to avert it. So that's why I actually think we are at slight risk of our democracies committing suicide. So the stakes in all of this are pretty high. Thank you. Do we have a little time for someone to disagree strongly with me or um yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean there's no way that you can ensure the security of illicit.com in a democracy they're going to be adversaries I feel like you gave too rosy of a picture of technology here and it's like maybe Maybe technology can be used for self-organization because it's a necessary condition of democracy. But there's no way that you can ensure the security of these AI tools in an environment where they're adversaries. And as Dan Dennett says, the way that people think of these AI technologies, they, they treat them as counterfeit people. They are counterfeit people, right? And these AI technology are like viruses. They mutate. I really like his, his analogy to viruses to have um, the powerful maintain power or for somebody else to come in. Yeah. And so at the heart of democracy, there are people. And technology, I feel like you gave too rosy a picture, <laughs> as a technologist. <laughs> <laughs> for what it's worth, the, 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 the EPI thing which we're developing as an alternative to illicit.com uh, in the thing I wrote, our, our model of using it will always be human teams alongside the technology interrogating but it, in my view, Mr. Boy, we just disagree. I think the technology does dramatically improve the capability of the human teams to quickly master lots of complex information. So maybe we just have to disagree on that. Yeah. But the people yeah. are going to treat the technology as counterfeit people because we already are saying all this stuff about how they're conscious, which they're not. Or saying yeah, but that's where we need everyone from policymakers to school kids to see these as tools, not as masters. Yeah, as imperfect. Should we uh, take a few more? Yeah. Yeah, I can't get a little bit. If you can get personhood to a national park, why can't you get personhood to, to AI? Why would you want to do that? So it can happen. It's probably, why would you want to get it to a national park? <laughs> so that can happen. Yeah, we, we may be heading there. I'm not. I'm. I'm yeah. <laughs> It might take it. I mean, I think the reason why New Zealand has done this, and there's a few other countries in the Pacific now copying the New Zealand approach, and I think Ecuador did this as well, is actually, um, I mean, it's quite a deep, almost philosophical, religious, political sense of dependence on the natural world, of gratitude to it, a sense of guilt about what had been the wrongs done to it, and that's why it's given legal personhood to protect it for the long term. So I don't think there's quite an analogy yet with an algorithm there. But um, there might be at some point, yeah. I didn't really answer your earlier interjection, I know. 
Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, I'm going to thank you for translating your graphics, your images to this uh, side of the puddle, the, yeah, the, the left-hand drive car. So that was, <laughs> all of your examples were uh, um, consistent for us to understand. Um, but I am going to go back to this. I, I, I would claim that there's been a lot of investment in technologies for, for de uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. Electronic voting systems. Mm -hmm. That's a technology for democracy. Mm -hmm. Lots of investment. It, it, it also depends sure. what you consider research and development. Mm -hmm. So who has to be the investor? Does it have to be a federal institution or companies that call this research and development? Uh, all of the market research that has transformed how you campaign mm -hmm. politically. A lot of money invested in that. So that, that's actually, and, and my, my larger point is that um, you invest in things, I believe, in a capitalistic society mm. that will result in translational results. Uh, you know, th things that people will separate their money from to, uh, mm. uh, to, to have. And democracy is not the kind of thing that uh, you market. That, that, that you, 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 so it, it's just a different beast yeah. than like uh, transportation. So in any sector, you can try and distinguish innovations which are positive sum from innovations which are zero sum. So let's say, you know, in, investment in, in flash trading uh, connections in finance, there's very strong motivation to do it, but it doesn't create, it doesn't create net wealth Overall, it just shifts the, the zero sum between different companies. And the marketing, all the spending on marketing and politics, I would say is of the same kind. It's a zero sum game in which there's strong incentive to spend. But what we'd be missing is the investment in the R&D, which would actually improve the quality, the value of the whole system. Uh, and in most business sectors, you get both. The weird thing is in democracy, how little of the R&D has actually been to improve the quality of decisions or deliberation or public understanding. So I think your argument is not that we haven't invested in uh, research for democracy, but for what you want. To yeah, in fair enough, fair enough. And if anyone has actually counted the numbers, I'd love to see. I've just never seen an analysis of an electronic voting. You know, that's, that's, that's fine, but it doesn't, again, of itself improve the quality of the system very much. Right, but again, a lot of money put into it. A fair amount of money, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, thank you for, uh, yeah. you know, really, really, you know, great, uh, you know, presentation and, you know, thought-provoking things, for sure, always, as always. Uh, I want to ask you, you know, in terms of, uh, because we're talking about social media, there's been a lot of effort, uh, like, recently to try to sort of regulate the bad out of social media. But it seems to be, you know, not much of an effort to actually create a healthy ecosystem that would mm. actually have incentive for more positive things to emerge. Mm. And I'm a bit worried that we sort of are going to be, you know, going into the same with AI, where all the focus of government will be to try to, you know, like maybe probably wrongfully try to regulate just the large language model, not the applications. But we are going to be making the same mistake. Yeah, so one of the slides I skipped over is one which you probably have some good answers on which was the question, how do you run a conversation at the level of a whole society? Which I, I hosted an, an event on last month because it's become very important across Europe. There's a sort of backlash against climate change action in many countries. The Netherlands, the, 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 the election earlier this year, the Farmers' Party, anti-climate action got the most uh, votes. Many politicians are feeling there isn't the buy-in to their net zero plans. Um, their decarbonization pathways. And traditional politics doesn't seem to be good enough at the moment at, at orchestrating a genuine conversation for a whole society which says, where do we want to be in 20 years time? There will be some sacrifices along the way. How do we have a fair sharing of the pain and of the upsides uh, and so on? And this is needed, this kind of conversation is needed on many things from say, pensions, to climate, to probably defense. And it's as if our means, our, both our media and our political parties, are no longer a, able to legitimate these difficult decisions. So the piece I did tried to look at some patterns on how to run difficult conversations, some more successful and some less successful, and some suggestions. But I would love people like you to be thinking about how can technologies help us orchestrate these They'll have to involve the elected politicians, but also non-political processes. They'll have to involve the science, but not only the science. 
And this seems to me absolutely vital for our societies, that we learn a better way of having conversations, at the end of which, even if your preference isn't being implemented, you still think the process has been fair and reasonable and therefore is legitimate. And if anyone here has got a good answer on that one, I would love to hear it. Ah, great. Thank you. Thank you. No, definitely don't have, don't have an answer for that. Uh, just thank you so much for the presentation. This is, this is really well done. Um, let me ask a question, which is you, you, that one of the early graphs you showed of the, the declining satisfaction and confidence in democracy mm -hmm. generationally. How? So let me use an analogy. Mm -hmm. So generally, and I'm looking at Seth, and Seth has seen this. Uh, we both worked in presidential administrations. And usually when the president goes through a bad election, you hear a phrase like this. The people like our ideas, we didn't communicate them well. Mm. It's not about what I'm doing, it's about the way that I'm either implementing mm. it, I'm talking about them, and so on and so forth. You rarely hear, ah, the voters just don't like what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. And so um, let me analogize that here, mm. which is, is part of the dissatisfaction, or a larger part, that frankly, a lot of voters may not like what our leaders are doing, may not feel confident in their leaders and not necessarily in how the um, democracy is being implemented, meaning we could have yeah. implementations of all these new technologies, yeah. but if our leaders are, and I'm going to use language that I don't agree with, but you'll hear, are feckless, they don't have courage, they're not visionary, um, we can have all these technologies, but if those things are not, uh, if the things being pursued are not what the people want, do you end up with the same result? Yeah, I think I basically agree with you, and that's why I was trying to emphasize the results as well as the feelings as being what explains those trends. And indeed, I think the comparative politics does show those countries where basically quite good results are still being delivered for people, their incomes are going up, they're feeling quite secure, there's good public services. Actually, trust hasn't declined that much in democracy. So Scandinavia, still fairly high trust, fairly confident in its systems, Whereas other countries where large minorities have had essentially stagnant incomes for a generation, see their services awry, uh, feel unsafe, it's not surprising they aren't so happy with the results. But I think there is also, on, even on top of that, something more happening, partly because of social media amplifying negativity. Um, uh, and you'll all know about the algorithms which, you know, are much more likely to spread something with anger, disgust, or fear than the opposite. And I was really struck by this piece of research that was about two years ago using um, on Google Books. I don't know if any of you saw this, which looked at every book written, published in English, Spanish, or German since I think it was 1850, and analyzed them by their emotional content and basically showed up to about the year 2000. There was a little bit like that. And then in the year 2000, it sort of, they go crazy. They called it cognitive distortions. These kind of extreme um, uh, views of things start appearing in all of these books as if the world started going a little bit crazy then. And of course, that was when social media and then smartphones and so on took over. So I think there is a there is something else happening overlaying that. So even if your government is actually quite competent, delivers quite good results, you're in a battle with some other forces which will uh, distort that. And in, in the UK, we've again and again had this phenomenon where people say, actually, my life's OK. My neighborhood's working quite well. But the nation is going to the dogs, because that's what they're reading in the newspapers or seeing on social media. And that's very poisonous. Because it then means there's actually no reward for the politicians to actually fix the real problems as opposed to doing culture wars or sort of superficial stuff. And that's why, for me, some answers to the governance of the social media ecosystem is an essential part of fixing democracy. So, so my question is, um, any technology, it's a race between doing good things and doing evil things. Mm -hmm. And if we were having a discussion about AI and healthcare, I'd say it's going to win out on the good. When it comes to democracy, I hope you're right, but I fear you're very wrong because it's easier and easier to create incredibly convincing mm. video evidence of people saying things they never said yeah. or things happening that never happened. And there is no trusted department of truth that says all those videos you saw next November 
of vans moving up to polling places with Biden ballots, mm. stealing the election yet again in a country already with no evidence. We've got 35 percent of the people mm. who believe the election was stolen with a pre former president that's a fact checker's dream. Yeah. That still has 50 percent of the population thinking he should return to the White House. H how do you arbitrate that? Because it will be incredibly persuasive. It will. Yeah. You'll look at it and you'll say, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that's happening. And by the time you have any forensics done on it, yeah. it's too late. Yeah. So this is a deep philosophical dilemma. And I've had many arguments in the last 10 years with people in this country about this question. Because my, my hunch, and I may be completely wrong, is that actually we need the law to get involved in truth. And many people find this an ab abhorrent idea uh, that you would actually create legal penalties for knowingly circulating misinformation or lies. To a, a li some liberal beliefs, that is an abhorrent thing to do. Germany has started to, well, actually passed a law which sort of moves one step in that direction. I mentioned the European Commission threatening fines for, for X. And I think we may be reaching a point where we do need to bring the whole weight of law and justice to the, the truth of our information ecosystems. And that will mean actually forgetting many principles many of us were brought up on and recognizing that unless we do that, we will have exactly what you described. And it will, in the, the many elections of next year, I think some remarkable proportion of countries have elections next year, where there will be just crazy fake videos of all kinds and disruption. And it may be we need a shock like that before, in order then to bring in a new set of, uh, of, of rules. And, and we have, I'm not a, a, a legal expert, and maybe we don't want courts and judges and juries de de determining on whether something was an, a knowingly spread falsehood. But I still haven't heard any alternative to that, which is credible, given the scale of the risk we now have. What, what's, what's your answer? Well, I mean, the, yes. You know, like you, like you look at Alex Jones, who's put the Sandy Hook families yeah, yeah. on the run for 11 years yeah. after they had five and six-year-olds yeah. murdered. In theory, we should have laws to do it. The problem with our democracy yeah. is the, the, a minority can block the things that would, would reduce their power. Yeah. You know, so you can't make a constitutional amendment if, if just 13 states block it. Right. And, and so the things that we could do that seem really appealing get blocked by the very democracy's ground rules, the democracy we hope to protect. Yeah. So I think different parts of the world will go very different directions on this. I say I think Europe will bring in some quite strict rules. China has brought in incredibly strict rules, obviously with a slightly different logic uh, there. And you may be a bit of an outlier in five or 10 years' time here in the US? 12 months. 12 months, OK. I don't know where we're doing on time. Are you, who's? Yes. We are done. We're done, OK. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a live stream audience. All right, yeah. We will uh, accede to the wishes of the web um, and uh, wrap up formally. And uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.